All right, so as people file in, I'm just gonna start with our general introduction to say hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. And before we continue this set of seminars with talks from Dr. Laurent Samuni and Dr. Aaron Westling, I will make a few announcements. First, if you're participating via Zoom, uh, you should see the Q&A tab at the top or bottom of your screen. And if you open that tab, you'll be able to type any questions that you have as well and see and upvote other people's questions. So at the end of the talk, we'll go through those questions, starting with the ones with the most votes. Secondly, recordings of all the talks will be available on YouTube shortly after they conclude. So if you need to leave early or know of others who are unable to attend live, this talk, these, both of these talks will be available for viewing and reviewing until after they're complete. All right, so with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Liran Samuni. Liran Samuni. Liran received her PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, where she studied the mechanisms of cooperation in wild chimpanzees. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at, the, at Harvard University and also holds the position as a guest researcher at Max Planck. She serves as the long-term data manage, manager for the Thai Chimpanzee Project, Ivory Coast. Liran's work integrates long-term data with behavioral and physiological methods to understand within and between group social relationships and cooperation exchange in chimpanzees and bonobos. And today I'm excited to welcome her where she's gonna talk about intergroup dynamics in bonobos. So with that, Liran, it looks great. Uh, so go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for the introduction. And then thank you, Matthew and Liz for the invitation to come to speak about my research. Before I dive into all things intergroup interactions in bonobos, I would like to briefly introduce to you all uh, the bonobos and the copulatory field state. Bonobos only occur within the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, here in gray is the distribution, and only south of the Congo River, which is considered a natural biogeographical barrier between bonobos and their sister species, chimpanzees. Much of what we know about bonobos come from research conducted in three long-term research sites in Lomaco, Luicotal, and Wamba, with Cocolopori only recently joining uh, the mix. What do we know? So what do we know about bonobos for all the years of research? Together with chimpanzees, they are humans' closest living relatives. They're long-lived species with uh, prolonged de development phase. Infants depend on the mother fully until about four to five years of age. And they typically start reprodu reproducing at their teens. They live in a multi-male, multi-female social groups in which males stay in their natal communities and females are the one to transfer between groups uh, upon reaching adolescence. Females maintain high social status within the groups and females are, typ are typically dominant over most, if not all males within a group. They live in a fission-fusion social dynamics, meaning that not all group members associate together at any given time, but instead they separate during the day into subgroups or parties of varying size, duration, composition. And as such, they have highly flexible association patterns. And lastly, bonobos are regarded as highly tolerant species, both to conspecific within the, in their own group, but as well to others across groups. Cocolopori bonobos have been followed by humans since 2007. And in 2016, uh, Professor Martin Suberg, with whom I work in Harvard, established a new uh, research site in Cocolopori, the Cocolopori Bonobo Research Project and initiated the data collection and the follow of the already habituated bonobos there. Overall, we have four social units, about 60 adults, 100 individuals. Uh, the social units are Kokolongo, Ekalakala, Fukako, and Bukako. The bonobos do maintain distinct home ranges. For example, here is the home range of Kokolongo in red, about 35 square kilometers, but they also have large overlap between them. So a Kalakala and Kokologo can share up to 65% of the, of the home range, a bit less with the Kako, and then even less with the Kako. But overall, the relationships are quite tolerant. 
And they have frequent encounters between individuals from the different social units. Those encounters can last a few hours, but even up to four consecutive days. And with, between a Kalakala and Kokolango, which is the two group who have the largest overlap, but also meet the most, it's about 30% of the observation time in which we see interactions between groups. And to contextualize these numbers within, within what we know about bono, bonobos in other sites, in Louis Cotal and Lomaco, those intergroup interactions are rare. However, in Wamba, which is the field site that is the closest to Kokolopori, about 60 kilometers away, we see very similar encounter patterns. In both field sites, there is those prolonged association and very, with a very similar number, it's about 30% of the time in both sites. The availability of food and the presence of maximally tumescent females influence the tendency to, for groups to meet each other. And they can be aggressive towards one another during those encounters. And in Kokolopori, those encounters have been shown to associate with increased HPA axis activity measured via urinary cortisol levels. With the aggression, they are also known to be highly tolerant. And during encounters, they can groom without group member, play with them, and even form coalitions and share food. And just as a demonstration of how peaceful and nice an intergroup encounter in Bonobo can be. Uh, this is an encounter between a Kalakala and Fakako. And this is a typical example of how encounters look like uh, during, uh, during most of the time. Individuals from different group hanging out together, very quietly grooming one another. Both Bonobos and chimpanzees Given they are so they are closest living relative, both are typically used as evolutionary models of human intergroup relations. Chimpanzees are highly territorial and they have predominantly hostile intergroup uh, interactions. They are predominantly aggressive towards outgroup members. And here is an illustration of the home range of three chimpanzees group from the Thai National Park. And you can see the there is very little home range overlap between them. And this occurs along the border areas where aggressive intergroup encounters tend to occur. As such, chimpanzees are often used to study the evolution of human warfare. In contrast, as I've already talked about, bonobos are considered non-territorial with large overlap between them and are highly tolerant. And as such, they were suggested as good model species to study the evolution of human intergroup tolerance and cooperation. However, I think this is a very important thing to point out. While in-group, out-group distinction is very clear in chimpanzees with tolerance only preserved towards in-group members in chimpanzees and hostility towards out-group members. In Bonobo, the frequent, prolonged and tolerant associations between individuals from different groups. And together with the fission fusion social dynamics, in which not all group members associate together at any given time, it creates a challenge defining the social borders of bonobo group. Or in other words, how can we be certain that bonobos perceive some of the individuals they associate with as their in-group members, while others as out-group members? And this is really important if we really wish to understand the social structure of bonobos. Social grouping patterns of closely related species may offer an alternative explanation for the social system of bonobos, one that may not involve in-group out-group distinction. For example, in chimpanzees, in one of the largest group, uh, the Ngogo group, largest known group, what we can see is that they have within their group, they form these within group subgroups or cliques. Here we can see a dendrogram of illustrating the two uh, neighborhoods or the two subgroups within the Ngogo community. Those cliques are characterized by increased association affinity of individual, but they still occur under the same umbrella of group membership. They're all Ngogo individuals. While some of those individuals uh, associate quite frequently, others may, may see each other only rarely, even less than what is expected uh, from the duration of intergroup encounters in Bonobos. Therefore, an alternative explanation to what we observe in bonobos can be 
that instead of having different groups that exhibit between group tolerance, maybe we just have one single large one of a group that encompasses those cliques, neighborhoods. In that way, cocoloporid one of us might be more homologue to the Ngogo system. And to really get at this question, we have to investigate the grouping patterns of bonobos in, in, in more detail. So to look at whether the social system of cocoloid bonobos can be described as either different groups with tolerant association between them or potentially one single group with within group cliques, we use three years of association data between all adult individuals within the population. And we calculated the dyadic association using a, a, a commonly used index, the simple ratio index. And we use the dyadic association to conduct hierarchical clustering analysis, uh, which identified in Cocolopori four clusters as the best cluster solution depicted here in the association dendrogram. What was interesting that the individual membership in, in the best cluster solution followed the unit membership that we as observers uh, call Cocalongo, Ekalakala, Fukako, and the Kako. We did this hierarchical cluster analysis for each year independently across the three years, and we always got the same solution. However, it's important to mention that the fact that the system clusters does not necessarily mean that these clusters are meaningful. So to evaluate the robustness of the identified clusters, use an intrinsic method for cluster quality, the silhouette coefficient, indicating how well each individual fits within their assigned cluster with values close to one indicating perfect clustering and values lower than 0.3 typically indicating weak clustering. Here are the silhouette results for Cocolopori. Each bar represents an individual and the different colors each representing a different cluster. And the average silhouette coefficient in Cocolopori was 0.56 indicating some robustness in this population. However, another important question is how comparable is this result to what we expect to find in a place like Ngogo? We therefore follow the same procedure on three years of association data and collected on the Ngogo chimpanzee community with, with this community representing the extremity of what we know about within group subgrouping patterns in chimpanzees. The clustering coefficient in Gogo was three times lower than in Cocolopori at 0.15, indicating overall weak clustering. Using the silhouette coefficient, we can additionally evaluate observation mismatches, indicating individuals that are potentially assigned to the wrong cluster. Those are identified as the number of individuals with negative silhouette values, as you can see here in the figure. And across the three years of data, mismatches were higher in Gogo between six to 26% than in Cocolopori with a maximum of 3%. These initial results indicate a robust clustering in Cocolopori, but not in Gogo, but this is only a first step if we want to investigate the underlying grouping patterns of Cocolopori bonobos. So to get at the question of in-group out of distinction, we looked in more detail at the association characteristics of the clusters we have identified in the bonobos. We investigated variation in the strength of association patterns, indicating the time individuals spent together, the home, home range overlap between diets, the individual fission decisions, when the individuals split into small group, subgroups, basically who goes with whom, and the spatial coordination of individuals from the same cluster during encounters. Variation in this domain can be informative on the structure of the population. So if, for example, we have two clusters, a circle cluster and a square cluster, then we would have different predictions and expectation on how those four domains, the association strength and the home range, home range overlap, et cetera, how they would look like depending whether there is in-group, out-group distinction or not. So if the Bonobo social system, system indeed encompasses distinct groups, that are tolerant to one another, we would then expect that the four domains that we are investigating, we show up clear patterns according to the cluster membership. However, in case of within group clicks, like in Gogo, what we would expect is to see some preference, but that this would not be consistent across time, across years. 
and across the four domains. As a first step to evaluate the dyadic association strength, we tested which dyads showed out of the population showed significant non-random association uh, preferences at 95% confidence. To achieve this, we conduct a series of data permutation that simulate random association patterns in the population while maintaining the underlying structure of the data. What we found is that significant associates only appeared within clusters and that when looking at the population as a whole, nearly all cluster members were significant associates. This supports basically the between group tolerance model in which we see clear distinction by the cluster membership. We then calculated the home range overlap of all diets within the population using the GPS locations and identified the relationship between the dyadic association index here on the um, x-axis and the home range overlap here on the y-axis. We found almost a complete separation in space between within cluster diets and between cluster diets in yellow across years. However, this was slightly less obvious in 2018 and I'm happy uh, if we have time during the question to, to give my insights on why I believe this is so. And again, the overall range use patterns indicate some separation according to cluster membership. We then looked at the fission decisions of individuals. And I think this is a very important thing, thing to look at when we are interested to get at uh, group separation or group identity. As a short recap, the Bonobo social system is highly flexible and individuals merge and separate during the day into parties of orion compositions. So whenever there is a separation of individuals, we could then look at who decides to go with whom and whether their cluster membership pattern can be detected in those decisions. So to reveal the set of rules underlying fission decisions, we use association rule mining, which based on probabilities, it reveals the sets of rules here individual, individual decisions underlying a system. What objects in a system are likely to be observed together? It is a method commonly used in economic transactions. And you might all, I'm sure, familiar with this when shopping online. So for example, if I was to go on Amazon and look for a sleeping bag, and I would scroll down, I would see this line in the bottom saying, customer bought this item also bought, in this case, a tent, a backpack, a sleeping mat. So the algorithm basically look at previous transactions of other customers and according to those probabilities offers me some recommendation of what else I might be interested in. So similarly, we can ask with the bonobos, when Chapman here in the center, a uh, female bonobo, when she leaves the group, who else decides to go with her? Are those individuals from her own cluster member or is it more random? Do we, do we can we detect a pattern or not? So again, if we have a circle individual fissioning with the group, who else is there? What is the probability those will be in group or in cluster members or not? And what we find that with over 95% uh, confidence that the rules explain the fission of an individual from the circle cluster were indeed other individual from the same cluster. And we never had a case in which other cluster members predicted the fission patterns of an individual from another cluster. Um, and basically cluster membership predicted very well the fission pattern at 95% confidence. As a final step to look at in-group out of distinction in association, we investigate the special coordination of individuals during intergroup encounters. In the animation is a uh, an encounter day between a Kalakal and Pokolongo, and each dot represents an observer for the GPS of an observer following a different group. And we can see nicely that during the day, uh, the, indiv the individuals don't stay all the time together, but they split and they merge. And during the follows, the observers obviously collect information of the identity of individuals they are following, which allows them to investigate the, the special distance individuals maintain from their own cluster members during those encounters. 
So we use this data to explore what is the maximum distance the bonobos would maintain from their own cluster members while they're associated with other, with individuals from other clusters. And this may serve as a proxy for the tendency of individuals to maintain cluster cohesion during these encounters. So for example, if one of the observer is following a party that contain individual from the circle cluster and one square individual, and another observer is following a party containing individ individuals from the square cluster, where they can then measure the distance between them and look how it varies. And what we found is that during encounters, at least at 95% of cases, the maximum distance that the individual maintained from their own cluster members was less than 400 meters. To contextualize this number, 400 meters is well, well below the audible range of bonobo vocalizations, which allows individuals to remain in contact over long distance. And during encounters, uh, sorry, during non-encounters, individual uh, maintained a much larger distance from their own group members of about 1,500 meters, indicating a greater cohesion when in the presence of individuals from another cluster. And these results suggest that during encounters, there is this increased uh, potential contact in space between individuals that belong to the same cluster. And to briefly summarize uh, those uh, characteristics that we saw, um, we found a robust and stable, stable clustering tendencies in Cocolopori, even compared with the most extreme chimpanzee group or the most modular chimpanzee group in which we know that neighborhoods and subgroups exist. Significant associates only occurred within clusters and almost all within cluster member were significant associates once we included the entire population. There was special segregation between the clusters. Cluster membership accurately predicted the fission patterns and there was high coordination with cluster members during encounters. And all those characteristics of the bonobo population dynamics, the consistent and predictable association patterns fit with prediction of in-group out-group distinction. Separate and distinct group that tolerate one another. But bonobo in-group out-group distinction is also materialized in the bonobo feeding behavior. And here I would like to briefly go to, a, to a, an additional project that I've been working on, looking at behavioral diversity. So given this prolonged association and the large home range overlap between bonobos, they offer an ideal context to identify environmental and social drivers of behavioral diversity. And this is so because it's often challenging for us studying wild animals, really separating environmental from social confounds of behavioral expressions. Because many social animals, they occupy non-overlapping areas. However, the 65% home range overlap between Kalakala and Kokalango potentially allows us to disentangle environment from behavioral correlates. Following the bonobos, we observed that the Kalakala individuals and Kokalongo prey on different species. While the Kalakala typically hunts uh, gliding rodents or anomalou, the Kokalongo individuals mainly hunt diker species. So to explore which predictor, predictors of behavioral diversity we could look at during hunting location, of the different prey types and how the utilization of the space impacts those. So if we see that the Kalakala only hunts in their unique areas, and so does Kokolongo, ecology can pretty much explain this, even or we won't be able to disentangle the two. However, if both individuals or both groups hunt in the same location and still specialize on different prey, we are able to uh, better detect what it is that causes this difference. So by investigating the race usage, the range usage difference between the groups and whether it's predicted access to prey, we can get at those uh, differences. What we found is that prey preference could not be explained by the difference in range usage or seasonality. Instead, the group identity, whether it was a Kalakala or Kokalongo predicted the prey outcome, here the hunt probability on the y-axis, with the Kalakala specializing on Anomalur and Kokolonko more on dikers and squirrels. What was specifically interesting that even during those intergroup encounters, when individuals associated together in the same in space and time, their prey preference still 
uh, was according to the cluster membership with the Kalakala hunting and Malur and Kokolongo mainly hunting dikers and squirrels. And to put it all in a final uh, two sentences, the results indicated vulnerable show some in-group out of distinctions in their association despite, despite them spending so much of their time together and despite them grooming with each other, playing, sharing food and even forming coalitions. And I think as, as such, they can really inform us on the evolution of outgroup tolerance. And the large overlap between the vulnerable groups offers a really great context to disentangle drivers of behavioral diversity, but not only the behavioral diversity, there's also many other, um, many other topics that we can really disentangle the effect of the environment from other parameters by look at, looking at different groups that spend their time in the same area. And with this, I would like to thank everyone I'm with Working World and especially for the Kokolopori uh, field team for the really hard, hard work. And thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much. That was a really great talk. Um, okay, so as questions filter in, I'll start with one of my own. I have so many. Uh, I'm just curious uh, if you could talk a little bit about what you think drives this between group tolerance and the bonobos. <laughs> I think this is the million dollar question. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so um, people, the, the, the common belief is that um, given the high status of females in the Bonobo, in the in Bonobo groups, females are the dominant, uh, dominance within groups. They form coalitions amongst females. They can even form coalitions uh, across groups to target males from their own group. And some of the idea is that females are actively maintaining the, the peaceful uh, nature of bonobos in relations. We do see that encounters happen more when there's more food. We do see that encounters occur more when females are in full tumescence. Um, so there are some costs potentially associated with those encounters. But it does seem that females are more active during those encounters in forming those grooming interactions with others and in forming coalitions to potentially maintain the, the tolerance. But again, this, is, this really needs to be investigated in more detail. For sure, thanks. Um, I think Matthew has a question, so I'll let him ask. Yeah, do you see a difference? You know, I know aggression rates are relatively low, but do you see differences in aggressive, aggressive behavior between individuals in the same group versus different groups? So how aggression looks like within the group and between the groups. Right. Uh, I would say aggression tends to be more coalitionary when we do have uh, intergroup encounters. And again, this is not necessarily that it's always one group targeting uh, another group. Um, and when you, you when you're with, with the bonobos during intergroup encounters, it's like a roller coaster of behavior. You know, they can there can be a massive aggression at one point, and then it comes down, and they continue traveling together, and they climb a tree, and they forage together, and then there's small aggressions on the tree that look very much like within group aggression, and then they groom, and then another big aggression uh, happening. It's when you're with them, it's very hard to tell. Um, this is you know the. This is two groups. So if there was an observer entering the forest, completely habitually vulnerable and know nothing about them, it's really hard to distinguish those two. Uh, but what we really see is very high predictability in how they move in space and how they meet and how they separate in according to those um, membership. And for me, what I'm very interested in and what my next steps are is really to look at it with aggression patterns, with grooming behavior, with food sharing, for example, and how those differ within groups and between groups. That's really great. I look forward to hearing more about that work when you, you know, after you have it done. Um, okay, so I think given the time, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Erin Wesley. Erin also received her PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, where she studied environmental constraints in savannas chimpanzees living on the edge of their range. Currently, Erin is a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard while also holding appointments as a visiting research scholar at the University of St. Andrews and as the regional coordinator for the IUCN Regional Action Plan for the Conservation of the Western Chimpanzee. 
Aaron is broadly interested in ecology, behavior, biogeography, and evolution in chimpanzees and bonobos, with the goal of using their evolutionary patterns to understand human evolution. She's also passionate about using scientific evidence to inform conservation policy. And today I'm really excited to hear about her talk on bonobo behavior as a crucial component of their ecology. So Erin, that looks great. Go ahead and take it away. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Liz, for the introduction and, and to Matt and Liz both for the, the invitation. Uh, as Liz just introduced, uh, today I'd like to present some of my ongoing research which centers around uh, bonobo behavior as a crucial component of bonobo ecology or rather as a crucial component the crucial component of better understanding than the world ecology. Ecology is, of course, central to most questions of behavior in wild animal research. It's central in research investigating reproductive strategies and life history characteristics, such as infant rearing or development. It's central to questions of understanding how and when competition evolves or some of the benefits of maintaining a high dominance rank. Uh, it's also central if we wish to learn more about grouping patterns, group cohesion and tolerance and cooperation. And we often advocate for the study of behavior of wild animals with the argument that those represent ecologically meaningful environments. But that then comes with the really big challenge of actually measuring components of that environment in a way that translates to something that's actually meaningful to understanding the behavior of those individuals. Um, Ecology is also a fairly straightforward go-to explanation for all things that we understand to be bonobo. As Liran mentioned, bonobos and chimpanzees are the closest living relatives of humans, but these two species differ in really crucial ways. The heart of these differences, nearly all hypotheses rest on the assertion that differences in ecology between these two species are the source of all differences in chimpanzee and bonobo behavior, uh, sociality and physiology, among other things, and specifically that the unique ecological context where we find bonobos has led to unique adaptations in this species. To be precise, bonobos are thought to live in an environment which is likened to some sort of Garden of Eden, a paradise in which resources are highly abundant and highly accessible. This then is hypothesized to have led to a vast suite of changes over evolutionary time in a many number of different ways, but many of these ways follow very consistent themes. And the main theme goes something like this. Bonobos evolved in an environment with high resource availability, which in turn relaxes intergroup or intergroup competition or both, uh, which therefore reduces one of the main traditional costs associated with group living, uh, thereby allowing a comparatively high amount of social co cohesion uh, especially for females, which are expe expected to bear the greatest brunt of these costs anyways. And by therefore accommodating greater female cohesion, females are therefore able to maintain uh, or socialize in a manner within the group that confers greater social status to them. Uh, and this continues and so on and so on. So while the av avenue of logic in bonobo research may not always follow this specific pathway, most research on the genus itself still bases that theoretical framework on this concept of ecological lushness in bonobo habitat being a really main uh, important evolutionary driver. But what does this actually mean to measure the lushness of an environment? Uh, a central component of operationalizing this concept of lushness and a central theme in many primatological questions is the quantification of specifically food resources in the environment. But to measure how much food is available in an environment to an individual or a group of individuals can be a really challenging task. This can be a challenging endeavor because it requires quantification over a diverse set of food items or potentially different species, uh, especially in larger primates. Um, resources need to be estimated for rather large spaces, which are not really realistically measurable via sensing of the environment itself. And food items or species can vary considerably in their overall abundance in an area, but serve different relative roles within the diet or generally even within the lives of an animal, thereby also making it a bit difficult to really tailor methods to be able to quantify species across a broad range from highly abundant species to relatively rare species. 
uh, and thereby creating a scenario where a researcher's estimation of abundance is accurate for some species, but not for others. Well, you can imagine that the concept of food availability indices are fairly straightforward, but practical application of this metric can be rather complicated. First is the complication of what to measure. And most primate research samples combine measures of local abundance with estimates of resource production or phenology. How we create an index also depends very much on its use, as these indices can help us understand variation in space uh, for comparisons between different sites or populations of a species, or to compare conditions over time to evaluate uh, resource variability at the intra-annual scale. The ways in which these metrics are highly variable uh, from study, study, study to study can also vary considerably in the range of a diet to be included in the metric, the inclusion of category, different categories of food items, the space and time from which sampling occurs to provide the foundational data that we use, and some indices also even include complementary components of diet quality, such as macronutritional content of the food items, or even use uh, different weighting terms to account for different preference, uh, food item preferences or size. But one challenge whose answer is always evaded these metrics is the necessary validation of translating how meaningful each component of that index can be directly to the consumer. Further, how can we really be sure that the index that we've created uh, is as a whole meaningfully captures the, the variation that we really intend it to? As I just mentioned, food availability indices are measured in a many number of different ways, but commonly they're always composed of a mixture of phenological data collected at regular intervals with some measure of resource abundance or density. The second main complication of these indices is also how to measure them. At least for static resources like trees, the quantification of abundance can be fairly simple, most commonly measured for at least chimpanzees and bonobos um, using standardized floristic or vegetation plots, in which for a given area such as a bonobo home range, comparatively small subsets of that range can be sampled in lieu of the impossible task of measuring all of the resources within the entire area. Such a method, however, is accompanied by a number of assumptions. First, most, most methods are built in a way that the sampling of plots is assumed to provide an objective measure of overall resource abundance within the area. Second, that the way in which plots are sampled can be reliably extrapolated to represent not only the entire usable area of a consumer's range of space use, but that biases in space use by that consumer don't actually translate to any sort of misestimation of actual availability. Third, that animals are not selective in which patches that the, they choose and that by simply accounting for which species and food items are included in a diet, um, that this also encompasses the breadth of selectivity by that animal. And lastly, that there is no variation within a food species or item with regards to how available it is to the consumer other than the phenological variation that we already account for uh, in most of these indices. However, the drawback of vegetation plot sampling is that plot sampling must be done in tandem or usually in additionally to direct behavioral observation. And this can, this is no small task. This can really represent quite a significant additional effort to ongo ongoing behavioral data collection. And likely because of this uh, additional effort that must go into measuring these plots, um, in primatology, plot sampling is conducted both infrequently and often at insufficient sampling depths to really be used um, for crafting reliable measures of densities within an ape's home range. So this led me to wonder if we're already following around uh, an individual or a primate or an ape, for example, a bonobo, why can't we just use the data that we're already collecting? In other words, if we follow a bonobo for a day and Apologies to the gorilla folks here. I couldn't find a good image for the bonobo. If we follow them for a day and they, they visit these trees, and then the next day we follow them again, we, and they visit these trees and so on and so on. Can we just use the aggregation of these data over time to also estimate for the, the, the abundances of these, these um, resources in the environment itself? So to look at this, we've collected data from two of the bonobo social groups that Liran just mentioned in the Coca-Cola Bonobo Reserve in DRC. 
Um, these home ranges of the two groups are depicted here in pink and blue with, and what is clearly noticeable is the extensive home range overlap between the two groups visible in purple. And this means that certain areas of the forest are sampled by more than one vulnerable group, which also allows us to investigate whether group specific sampling of the habitat occurs. We amassed uh, a data set of over 250 plus, I'm not sure exactly how many we're at right now, uh, vegetation plots collected in the home range of at least one of these social groups. And these are visible here in the black dots. And then to see if we could use bonobo behavior as an alternative means of sampling, we then compared these results with an observational data set collected over three and a half years. This data set consists of basically all locations where bonobos were observed to feed on a tree or a liana, uh, the size of those resources and the size of those resources. And we then use these locations to create a proportional presence index of each species uh, within all possible locations of the, of the home range. So for example, just to give you an idea of what this looks like, you can see here the sampling information uh, from bonobos of locations of the most commonly consumed food item, bolingo. Uh, for the whole range of the Kala Kala social group. Before we look at, you know, what these data can tell us, we first, as a first check, we really need to ensure that the three years of data that we have are first sufficient to provide density estimates of species in the landscape. To do that, we can first take a look at how data accumulate over time to check that as our data set ages, that bonobos feed upon fewer and fewer new locations per food species, uh, depicted here in black. And also as a double check, we could also compare this to how many locations bonobos revisit over the same time period uh, depicted here in red. If all goes well, as in the species that I've uh, shown here, the addition of new locations should slow over time, showing that our data are saturating. In some cases, however, we did notice that the data don't saturate, um, meaning that they may, we may need to continue to collect more data to really reliably estimate their density. But I think this doesn't actually mean that the data set itself is not robust for density estimation. We can also verify that the method for estimating density uh, from the aggregation of these data is reliable and stable by comparing our proportional presence indices of each food species uh, in the consumer data set as the data set grows with the abundance me measurements that we would otherwise normally have measured from the, the vegetation plots. While initially you can see, see here on the left of each figure, the estimates from the observational data are quite variable as they compare to the, to the vegetation plots. Uh, that as the data set fills in over time, the strength of the agreement between the methods actually stabilizes after about 600 days of data collection per group, indicating that at the least our data set, which is already twice uh, the dura that duration, is unlikely to considerably change as more data are collected. And that agreement between the methods will only continue to improve, but uh, very unlikely to degrade. So from then on, we can look at what these data actually tell us. First, it's, I was rather surprised, but Nobos seem to be quite efficient ecological samplers, treating their forest as their, as their buffet, uh, as they feed on species that account for over 62% of all individuals in the forest. Next, we found that data collected by different groups in the same area results in different density estimates for each uh, food species because they feed on different trees at different frequencies. These results thereby underline what many ecologists have already demonstrated before me, that individual animals are selective about from which individuals they consume. And as Liran showed that this selectivity may also extend to group preferences. As such, differences in selectivity between groups also has an impact on the density estimates uh, derived from their feeding patterns, but it also means that our concepts of what is available or interesting to individuals in a social group may also be different even if the environment is the same. So this would not have otherwise been captured if we were only using these objective vegetation plots to measure food availability. These points are further underlined uh, by one example of potential selection criteria. For nearly a quarter of consumer species, about 23%, we found that more individuals in the plots didn't even arrive at the minimum size of the tree or lianas consumed by a bonobo than those who did exceed this minimum threshold. And that by reducing the number of individuals considered in the, the vegetation plots to only those who can actually meet the minimum sizes of what we observe with the bonobos can actually drop the estimated abundances of relative, relevant individuals by almost 
And lastly, within our three-year data set, we also noticed that bonobos miss or ignore, or in other words, they failed to ever visit on average about 20% of the resources that would have otherwise been included in a food availability index that was comprised from data on, in vegetation plots. So within these three points alone, we've already demonstrated a, a violation of some of these assumptions I just mentioned of vegetation plot sampling to be an accurate measure of resource availability. But more convincing yet, given that bonobos are demonstrably ignoring some resources in the landscape, it would be presumptuous to therefore assume that we as the observer even understand well all the factors which contribute to bonobo resource selection. Because of this, we should consider that when we estimate availability based on abundances in habitat or vegetation plots, that we're still oblivious to some of those factors of selection and aren't necessarily measuring what is actually important to the number of individuals. Therefore, using the consumer as our surveyor already provides the lens through which resource availability can be evaluated because the bonobos are filtering relevant resources from the irrelevant for us. So because of these biases that we see in terms of the resources that bonobos use relative to what is measured, we can conclude that vegetation plots are not fully representative of the resources that are important to bonobos themselves. But at the core of our question, when we consider the bonobo data, does it at least correlate well with the data that are anyways collected using vegetation plots? Even if there is noise in what we measure with the vegetation plots, we should still expect the density estimates provided by each method of collecting data more or less should be measuring similar things. If indeed the method of estimating uh, food species densities from feeding locations is valid. So if we compare the two directly, we can see that the densities from both data sets do track moderately well, but imperfectly. Our correlational strength between densities estimated from vegetation plots and those for species estimated from bonobo uh, sampling indicates a mean correlational strength or an R of 0.54. Um, however, under certain conditions, the strength can reach as high as 0.7. We also know that these correlations remain fairly stable against variation in space with, within the home ranges of the bonobo groups that regardless of if we include only in the most heavily used areas to calculate densities or even the outer reaches where the bonobos don't visit super often, that the correlations remain approximately the same. We also find a similar pattern across the range of the species in the diet as well. Although we generally find that the two methods correlate most strongly if we compare only the top half of the diet or the, the, the species which are most frequently sampled. That these two measures correlate moderately well, but imperfectly is reassuring because we already know that biases exist in how bonobos select resources. We know that the correlation should anyways not be perfect, but that they're already so strong after only three years of data indicates that our bonobo data are reasonably representative of what we should be expecting it to measure. So collectively, these results underline that our common ways of objectively measuring food availability in a landscape, such as with vegetation plots, don't actually measure true availability to a consumer, but rather potential abundance of food resources from which consumers could select. Rather, it's the measurement of resources that are subjective to the consumer and which account for the filters of selection applied by that consumer that actually demonstrate to us the amount of resources available in the landscape. Importantly, these two measures, abundance and availability, are not the same thing, and I think they're often confounded in the literature. But it's important to note that one is actually a subset of the other, with only the subset being the target of most animal research studies. We can learn, therefore, from three years of bonobo data, at least how to incorporate these selective filters to evaluating resource availability without actually even needing to know what those filters are. And we can also know now that we can reliably measure density of those resources using data that are already common to commonly collected in most research programs. To switch gears a bit, I can use the example of bonobo nesting behavior next as an example of how understanding behavior is not only a poten potential tool for evaluating bonobo ecology, but rather a necess necessary tool and behavioral ecology should be considered in other domains such as conservation. 
Anyone who might know a bit about bonobos uh, might know that relative to chimpanzees, they're presumed to live in a relatively stable, rich environment, as I've earlier mentioned, and therefore are theorized to have relatively weak environmental drivers of behavioral diversity. Whereas chimpanzees occur over a much broader range with uh, comparatively variable environmental conditions, both spatially as well as temporally. And therefore there's already extensive documentation of the wide array of behaviors within and across sites uh, in chimpanzees. However, we do know from Liran's work that bonobos can demonstrate behavioral variability well, even across groups living within this very same environment. So to come back to my example, efforts to understand the status of the species across the range, like most great apes, uh, are typically focused on population estimates that are derived from nest counts. Bonobos, uh, in case you're not familiar, construct nests each night before they go to sleep so that they have a stable platform on which to sleep comfortably. Even after this bonobo has left their nest, the nest remains largely intact in there and easily recognizable. And that allows us to use the nest as an indirect sign of presence. So to estimate bonobo presence in an area, we typically follow a simple equation. We take the count of the nests that we find during a survey and divide it by the size of the area surveyed, as well as other count for other factors which might affect the likelihood to detect the things that we're counting, in this case, nests. These tip, in the case of nest surveys, these typically account, uh, boil down to two factors. First, the length of time after a nest is constructed until it falls apart and is no longer visible, or in other words, the nest decay rate, which is highly impacted by factors in the local environment. For bonobos, for example, we know that in drier regions, nests last on average half a year, whereas in wetter areas, they, can, they sometimes only last around three months. First, it's interesting to note that although the environment in which bonobos are found is thought to be considerably less variable and more environmentally stable than chimpanzees, relative to the variability of decay rates that we see across the range of chimpanzees, ranging from uh, 70 days up to 170 days depicted here in blue, we actually see that bonobo nest decay rates uh, depicted here in pink also vary across the full extent of what we see in chimpanzees. So given that surprise, could the bonobo behavior half of nest surveying be just as variable? Although decay rates have received a great amount of attention until now, the number of nests each individual bonobo constructs on average in a day, or the nest construction rate, uh, has received comparatively little attention. Could we be completely underestimating behavioral variability in the bonobo? And what are the consequences that this has for population monitoring? This is important because bonobos not only make nests for sleeping in at night, but they can also construct nests during the day to lounge in. This means that if we count two nests when surveying, that might not actually indicate that it's two separate bonobos who constructed it. Until now, all bonobo nest surveys have used two values of nest construction. Some have used a simple assumption of one night nest constructed per day, completely ignoring that they, they do on occasion uh, build day nests, while others have measured behavior of males and females separately and then calculated an average of 1.37 nests constructed per day. It's important to note that these values already differ by over a third based on the observation of a single site alone. Now, if we allow for the possibilities that bonobos might also construct day nests flexibly across the range, we might be looking at some serious under or overestimations of bonobo densities. So looking at the nest construction behavior of bonobos living in the Kokolopori field site, we could show that a single bonobo can construct even up to six nests over the course of the day, and that this pattern is actually a seasonal pattern. If we also consider that nest decay rates can vary across sites, and given that bonobo nest behavior is seasonal over the course of the year, so too can our estimates of what an average nest construction rate be as well, with shorter decay rates allowing for more severe seasonal variation in uh, construction averages, whereas longer decay rates average this behavior over a greater period of time. As a result, at Kokolopori, we see that they create on average 1.9 nests per day, and that potential nest construction can, can vary considerably depending on the time of the year and also the length of, the time, uh, length of time a nest takes to decay. This variability in nest construction rate, while overall a rather mundane behavior, can actually have drastic consequences for our estimations of bonobo populations across the range. 
If we take a look at the bonobo densities that we've estimated till now, indicated here in the black dots, and if we account for the likelihood that bonobos could produce any number of the construction rates that I've just mentioned uh, here in, in, in gray, the potential, uh, and then consider that in the potential predictions of what the true bonobo densities could be across all of these different sites. It, it shows us that we're likely overestimating bonobo densities by an average of 20%, uh, 27%, excuse me, uh, and this can reach up uh, as high as 80%. To even complicate it further, if we also factor in the variability in nested hay rates as well, uh, now with the predictions uh, here in red, the picture of what true bonobo densities could be across the range actually becomes even muddier. Collectively, these results point to a great deal of uncertainty in single predictions of bonobo density and complicate our ability to understand spatial and temporal patterns of these densities. So while the examples I've provided here are bonobo specific, they can easily be generalizable beyond the species to apply to many other behaviorally flexible species. In this way, I think I'd like to conclude by arguing that even if our strongest interest is in understanding species ecology and the role that a species environment plays in shaping behavior, that often our understanding of that species ecology cannot, cannot in any way be disentangled from some basic understanding also in how behavior and specifically behavioral flexibility also shapes our ability to measure the relevant characteristics of their ecology. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Great, thank you so much. That was a really, really nice and interesting talk. Um, I have a bunch of questions as usual. I'm sure Matthew probably has too. And please audience, uh, use the Q&A tab to ask your questions. This is your opportunity. Um, I'm gonna start off and ask, um, do you think that resource distribution or abundance affects how reliable or the, the values that you get from the observation data with the bonomos versus the vegetative plots? In that local resource distribution could affect our ability to compare the two values? Yeah, so I was just thinking about like, would you get higher correlations if the research distribution was more clumped versus more like randomly distributed? Um, and how that might affect the correlation between the values, yeah. Sure, I'm trying to remember if I looked at that actually in the paper. Um, I, I did evaluate whether or not these two different um, methodologies could also agree on the clumpiness or distribution of species, and I used the Morositas index in that case. Uh, and I found that really the, the best, um, the best use of bonobo observational data in this, in this case is really for estimating food species densities that somehow, you know, just by the nature of how the, the data are distributed over, over time and space that it, it becomes much more complicated when you try to break it down into smaller pieces. So it didn't do a great job of, of agreeing on, um, on yeah, clumpiness, measures of clumpiness in this, in this case, Maurice does I, um, but, it also didn't do a super great job when you break it down even further into trying to estimate local resource uh, distribution within the home range. Because I think at least in our case with three and a half years, we just don't have sufficient data. I think maybe in a 10 year data set, you can, you can see that really lovely um, data saturation over time. Um, you can assume that by that point, the bonobos have really done their due diligence of, of checking out all the potential uh, options there. Um, and I think it would work well, but within our data set, uh, food species density across the landscape was really the only um, thing that I would say that it's a, a really valuable uh, tool for. Cool, thanks. It's, it's a really nice uh, observation, so thank you. Um, I think Matthew also has a question, which he's gonna ask. Well, I was, in, I was interested in the kind of the 20% of food sites that they don't seem to visit um, and whether, you know, maybe drawing a connection across these two talks, whether, uh, range overlap accounts for any of that uh, avoidance behavior, or, or if not, why you think it is that they just don't go to those places? I think that would be my key underlying point here is that we don't know. Like, I, I think most animal ecologists would agree that they have some good guesses of why animals are ignoring uh, resources, but that's as good as it gets. They are guesses. There's there's so much about 
these decision-making processes in, in, in resource selection, at least that, that we just can't really get at. And it's super like, how do you know what you don't know even? So I think that's, that's a good argument of why to use the benevolent behavior, the animal behavior itself to, to just filter that out for you because it takes all the guesswork out. Um, in terms of the role of intergroup uh, encounters, would you have comments on that? About what? I wouldn't, I personally have not viewed um, competitive exclusion between the groups. Maybe, have, have you ever? I mean, they really, they travel together. The um, work of a PhD student from the lab did find that they tend to target larger trees during encounters with the, with the, as an explanation, potentially a tree that can support more individuals fitting on uh, there. So they, they, they even travel longer to target certain trees. Um, so that potentially might play a role, but all this area, they can be there while they are in an intergroup encounter, but also when they're not in an intergroup encounter, yeah? So they potentially, this is a way to disentangle the two. If, 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 if in those situations, they do choose different resources, depending if they're in the presence of others or not. I mean, this is a good argument also of why it's good to look at bonobos um, as a study species in this context, because an assumption that you have to make with with looking at this data set and, and the data accumulation is you need to be able to reliably assume um, that individuals have full access to everything that you're sampling so that there's no explicit like hardline exclusion happening um, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to reliably do any sort of um, estimations or surveying in that way. Um, so that's a fairly common assumption in these types of studies. Thanks. Okay, so we have a question from Anne PC. She first says, lovely talks, thanks to you both. Uh, given that you've both studied chimpanzees as well, I'd love to hear your gut reactions about whether you think that the bonobos are really living in a comparative garden of Eden. <laughs> we just talked about it. <laughs> uh, I think you could probably get a hint from my tone in my talk that I'm not entirely sold yet on this, uh, on this argument. I think, I think that's a really, it's, it's one thing to do these one-to-one -one comparisons, and that's all we've really been able to afford until now is to take a chimp, you know, the ecology of a chimpanzee site and compare it with a bonobo site. Um, but I think, A, given what we already know about chimpan the chimpanzee side, there's so much variability there that you know, it's really hard to know how representative is my one data point of what's important ecologically um, you know, it, when we talk evolutionary drivers. And so given the fact that we know comparatively so little about bonobos, you know, Liran showed maps of, of three, four total data uh, field sites that we've had, and that's everything that we know about bonobo ecology or bonobo behavior. Um, I don't think we're really on safe footing yet to say like any one of those data points are necessarily a representative um, or that you know we're at a point where we've we've got really good comparative data. I think um, if you're familiar with some of the other talks I've given, um, you might know that this is one of my large-scale, long-term uh, research aims in the future. I do think that one thing that might be different is because we could, can look at it two ways. We can look at the lushness of the environment, and we can look at how predictable an environment is, right, or how stable resources within an environment is, and my guess is that if we, the difference is probably more likely to be in a, a more stable potential environment for bonobos. But for me, what's always puzzling is, you know, we are looking at bonobo groups of 40 individuals, maybe over a, a range that is 35 square kilometers. And there are chimpanzee groups with 70 individuals living in a in, for example, in Budongo, in a home range that it's six, seven square kilometers, supporting 70 individuals, right? So I think we really, to get at this, we really have to, sample size is really crucial. We really have to, to look at across the range. Uh, and generally, bonobo densities do seem to be lower than chimpanzee densities, so, yeah. Yeah, you touched on what I was gonna say next. Yes. And, and, and I can see you picked up on that as well. I, if you really, if you compare directly the, the densities of the two species, also bonobo densities are surprisingly low. And, and we often use animal densities as a proxy of kind of the resource uh, abundance or the resource richness of environment. And so I think that 
Um, that seems to point in there may be other explanatory factors going on here. For sure. I think that is a great way to end your talks today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights onto bonobo, bonobo behavior. That was a fascinating set of talks. And for all of you out there, we will be here same time, same place next week. And we hope to see you there. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.